Ever wonder what keeps nature in check? Like, um, why aren't we just absolutely overrun with, like, ladybugs or something, you know? Yeah, well, nature has its ways of... Uh... Today we're diving into ecosystems, these amazing webs of life, and believe me, it gets really interesting. Yeah, we're going deep on this one, talking about carrying capacity, and it's it's way more than just a simple definition, right? So we're going beyond just, like, how many squirrels can fit in a forest, right? Right, it's more about, like, how many can actually thrive in that forest over time. Like, mm -hmm. imagine a bunch of deer. Yeah, right? okay, yeah, picture it. So they've got all this food, no predators, the population just explodes, but then what happens? They eat everything. Yeah. And then they starve. It's like that rabbit problem in Australia, right? Exactly. Carrying capacity in action. It's a reality check. You know, unchecked growth just isn't sustainable. That's a really good way to put it. And it's not just about food, though, right? I mean, our sources talk about all kinds of factors affecting this. Oh, absolutely. Like climate change, that's a big one. Even a small change in temperature can totally shake things up. Some species might do great, while others... Well, they're out of luck. Yeah, I see what you mean. It really is a balancing act. So there are all these different factors deciding how many individuals an ecosystem can actually support. And then there's this thing called the Lotka-Volterra model. What's that all about? Oh, yeah. The Lotka-Volterra equations. That's how ecologists map out, like, predator and prey relationships. So, so it's not random. There's math behind it. It's all about understanding how populations change based on things like how many are born, how many die, and this is the big part, how different species interact. Like back to your deer, if we suddenly introduce wolves, those equations can help predict what happens to the deer population. That is really cool. So this carrying capacity isn't just a fixed number. Not at all. It's always shifting, always changing because of so many different things. Which makes me think, how can we even talk about stability in an ecosystem if it's constantly in flux? That's the heart of it, right? When we talk about stability and ecology, we don't mean things stay the same. It's about resilience and ecosystem's ability to bounce back from disruptions. Okay, I think I get you. Like um, like a strong building, right? It can handle a storm, maybe sway a bit, but it doesn't just collapse. Perfect analogy. Think of a forest after a wildfire. A stable ecosystem, it'll recover, maybe not look the same. But the important stuff, the processes, the interactions, they come back. Right. So it's not about being unchanging. It's about being able to recover. Exactly. Okay. I'm starting to see how this all fits together. But what about us? Humans are part of these ecosystems too, right? We are indeed. And our role in all of this, well, that's a whole other conversation. And I have a feeling it's not always a pretty one. So we're talking mm -hmm. about ecosystems, yeah. right? This delicate balance, this carrying capacity. But we haven't really touched on the elephant in the room. Us. Right. Humans. Mm -hmm. We're part of these systems, but we also, well, we tend to mess things up. To put it mildly. So how do our actions, you know, all the stuff we do, how does that impact this whole carrying capacity idea? Well, our impact is everywhere, yeah. right? And it's not always good. We depend on ecosystems, but we also push them really hard, sometimes too far. Yeah, and our sources don't sugarcoat it. They talk about some pretty serious consequences. One example that comes to mind is deforestation, yeah. especially in the Amazon. It's heartbreaking, honestly. Okay. And it's not just about the trees, right? It's the entire ecosystem, all those species that depend on that forest and its role in the climate. It's a mess. It's like we're pulling a thread on a sweater and suddenly the whole thing's unraveling. That's a good way to put it. And it's not just about chopping down trees, right? Pollution's a huge factor too. Oh, absolutely. Think about ocean acidification. All that carbon dioxide we pump into the atmosphere, well, the ocean absorbs a lot of it. And it changes the water, makes it more acidic. And that's a problem because... Big problem. It's really bad for marine life, especially things like corals and shellfish. Their shells are made of calcium carbonate, and the acid, it dissolves them. Wow, that's, that's pretty scary. And it's all connected, right? What we do here affects what happens over there. Speaking of which, our sources talk about this really interesting case study, the zebra mussel. Oh, yeah, the zebra mussel. Uh. A classic example of unintended consequences. So what's the deal with these mussels? They seem kind of harmless when you just see a picture. But they might look innocent, but they're actually quite invasive. They came from Eastern Europe, hitched rides on ships, and ended up in North America. And, well, they took over. Took over how? They're these incredibly efficient filter feeders. They outcompete native species for food. They clog pipes. They damage boats. It's a whole thing. Wow. So they really messed things up. They did. And it all goes back to that interconnectedness, right? Yeah. One little change can have huge ripple effects. Which brings us to another big idea our sources keep coming back to. 
biodiversity. What exactly does that mean and why should we care? Biodiversity is basically the variety of life in an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And the more diverse an ecosystem, the more resilient it is. Think of it like, I don't know, your investment portfolio. Mm -hmm. You want diversity, right? So if one thing crashes, you're not totally wiped out. Makes sense. Ecosystems are the same way. If there's lots of different species and something changes, the whole system is more likely to bounce back. But if we lose species, if we simplify things too much, it's like knocking out the supports of a bridge. It gets weaker, more vulnerable. Yeah, I get it. So we're facing some huge challenges here. Climate change, pollution, invasive species. We're putting a lot of pressure on these ecosystems. Honestly, it's kind of overwhelming. What do we do? Where do we even start? So where do we go from here? It's easy to feel helpless after hearing about all these problems. It's true. The scale of these issues can feel, well, overwhelming. Hmm. But we can't give in to that feeling, right? We have to remember, we're not just along for the ride. We can make a difference. Easier said than done. Right. But our sources all agree on one thing. We need solutions. And not just any solutions. They have to be the right solutions. Absolutely. It's not enough to just do something. We have to think it through and consider the consequences, both good and bad. Otherwise, we might just make things worse. Yeah, like, I don't know, trying to fix a broken leg with a Band-Aid, it's not going to cut it. Our sources talk about understanding cause and effect, so it's about looking at the whole picture. Exactly. It's about thinking beyond those simple solutions. Yeah. Like, deforestation is bad, so let's just plant a bunch of trees. Sounds good on paper, right? Right. But it's not that simple. We have to think about what kind of trees, where they're planted, how they'll affect everything else around them. It's all connected. So how do we make sure the solutions actually address the root of the problem, not just the symptoms? It takes careful planning, for one. We need to really understand the specific ecosystem, what's happening, why it's happening, and we have to be willing to learn from our mistakes. <laughs> a lot of times we've tried to fix things and ended up making them worse. Right, like those king toads in Australia. Good idea in theory, total disaster in reality. Exactly. It's a good reminder that we have to approach this with humility. We don't have all the answers, but we can learn and we can adapt. Okay, so big picture stuff, I get it. But what about me, just one person? What can I really do to make a difference? It's tempting to think that our individual actions don't matter, but that's just not true. Think about it. If everyone felt that way, nothing would ever change. Every decision we make, every choice we make, it has an impact. So what kind of choices are we talking about? What can people actually do in their daily lives? It starts with awareness, right? Paying attention to where your food comes from, how it's grown, how it gets to your plate, thinking about the products you buy, the companies you support, do they care about the environment? Do they prioritize sustainability? And it's about using your voice. Talk to your friends, your family, your elected officials. Let them know that this matters to you. So it's not just about recycling or remembering your reusable bags. It's about being conscious consumers, making informed choices. Yes. And it's about realizing that we're all in this together. The future of our planet, it's not someone else's problem. It's on all of us. That's a really powerful message. We've covered a lot of ground in this deep dive, from the delicate balance of ecosystems to the very real challenges they face. But we've also talked about hope, about solutions, about the power we all have to make a difference. Absolutely. And remember, this conversation doesn't end here. Keep learning, keep asking questions, and keep looking for those aha moments that can inspire real change. Perfectly said. And on that note, thanks for joining us for this deep dive. Until next time, stay curious.